Good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to this uh, lunchtime ETSYM lecture titled Validation of Probabilistic and Artificially Intelligent Crown Models in Predicting Solid Transition. The lecture will be given by Rajiv Grandgrady. Rajat is a geotechnical and tunneling engineer at Arup's San Francisco office. He works on design aspects of soft ground tunnel projects. Rajat's interests lie in the digitalization of geotechnical and tunnel boring machine data, ground spatial variability, and the synthetic quantification, application of artificial intelligence in tunneling, and geospatial assessments. He has a PhD in underground construction and tunneling from Colorado School of Mines and a master's in geotechnical engineering from Virginia Tech. Rajat's professional experience involves working as a geotechnical engineer with ECOM and Jacobs in underground metal project in India and North America, respectively. Rajat serves on the Underground Construction Association Young Member Committee and is focused to grow the tunneling community. Once again, thank you for dialing and I'm handing over now to Rajat. Thank you. Hey, thanks, George. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to the presentation. I'm happy to present on validation of probabilistic and artificially intelligent ground models. Uh, and in specific terms, we'll talk about um, soil transitions um, because one of the critical features of subsurface. I'm currently working as a tunneling engineer um, at IRP, um, mostly on soft ground tunnel projects. Um, and before I begin this presentation, this is my work from my PhD. So I would like to thank uh, the Center for Underground at Colorado School of Mines and the University, University Transportation Center for their support. And obviously, thanks to uh, Mike Mooney, who's been um, a great advisor, and Hong Ji Yu for collaborating on um, uh, sharing some slides for this presentation uh, and developing the artificial intelligence model. So, why why are we talking about transitions in the first place? Uh, pretty pretty um, niche topic when it comes to tunneling, um, but. I, when I was in my PhD, I think one of the biggest um, issues that we came across was um, contractors not understanding or not able to quantify where the transitions would occur. And both in the longitudinal direction of tunneling and in the um, transverse direction of tunneling. And I came across this reference, uh, British Tunneling Society in 2005, I think they summarized about 89 or more than that uh, tunneling case histories um, and uh, said 55 percent of the projects uh, involved a lack of quantifiable knowledge of soil transitions and that led to excessive deformations so this was a good motivation to solve the problem develop a research methodology for the same um, worldwide sure there have been significant ground movements um, Washington Metro Transit Authority did tunnels in soft ground in 1993 um, and um, experienced significant ground movements because of uh, mixed phase conditions or a lack of quantifiable knowledge of the transitions. And a similar problem occurred in Kolkata in 2020. Um, ground subsidence, actually in this case, the TBM hit a water aquifer um, but they were unable to, before they hit the water aquifer, they were unable to identify um, the transition um, between the two major uh, geologic units. So loss of phase stability obviously led to ground subsidence, reduced TBM advance rates, water in rush, um, um, difference in the rate of cutter pool where are some of the um, other issues that are experienced when it comes to geologic transitions. Has no one addressed this before? Um, there has been effort on quantifying what is the ground uncertainty, but not on specific subsurface features such as uh, soil transitions. Um, when I presented this or posted 
on um, social media platforms like LinkedIn. Um, many engineers came back, especially from Europe, um, saying this is a waste of time. We have had successful tunnel project before. And I agree, and I sincerely thank you for delivering successful tunnel projects uh, because that increases the confidence of the community in tunneling. Um, but nowadays, the consequences of risks have skyrocketed. Um, there is more at stake. Um, we are building in more complex environments. We are, as we as engineers, are delivering projects at a much faster pace. Um, considering uh, the important aspect of safety. So in my personal opinion, uh, the stakes are high and we need to <clears throat> find solutions for some of the critical challenges that we face while tunneling in soft ground. To give you a good example of what, I, uh, what I'm trying to talk about when I talk about transitions and can be looked at in multiple ways. So, uh, if you can see my laser pointer over here, we have a um, profile drawn for a project in uh, Circle Line project in Singapore, um, and they were expected to, and they were supposed to tunnel from right to left. Um, they had about five boreholes on that project initially. Uh, they drew a nice, beautiful profile between a transition between soil and rock. And anticipated, well, most of our tunneling is going to be in rock, and uh, we have sufficient cover uh, in that case. So we're not going to have experience in a ground deformation. We're not going to disturb the soil. So we can just start tunneling. And when, when we come over here, we understand there's going to be a transition. So we'll adjust our parameters for soil. And when they started tunneling from right to left, um, just at the start of the drive, they uh, just had a sinkhole. And this was the initial interpreted rocket level. So what happened after that, um, the contractor went out and switched cheese the ground, um, just drilled a number of boreholes. You can see the addition of boreholes over here. They just wanted to know what the profile was. And it wasn't as what was anticipated earlier. So there is obvious uncertainty into the ground um, in uh, where the transitions occur, where the interface between the two material are. So for example, in this case, when they started tunneling from right to left, what really happened was they did not actually have any rock cover. Um, all they had was uh, soil cover and I guess there were weaker layers of soil. Plus you can see the difference between the rock head elevation uh, before and after a lot many investigations done. So this is not the ideal way to do additional site investigations uh, in the first place. Um, and second, um, if there would have been a quantification of what is the probability of encountering completely a uh, soil completely into the tunnel phase, um, they wouldn't have probably encountered that problem. So sinkhole formation, uh, one of the biggest uh, issues when it comes to um, TBM interacting with two different soil types uh, with different mechanical properties. These are some additional examples. Um, unexpected change in ground conditions caused a uh, devastating sinkhole in, uh, in China. And then, uh, from Pacific Northwest um, um, on one of the projects, uh, you can see a massive, a massive sinkhole pretty close to the uh, urban environment. And that is why I say the stakes are high. Um, when a TBM hit a sandy clay interface and there was over excavation. So we have inadequate knowledge of ground conditions um, that leads us or that gives us a very poor interpretation of what the tunnel excavation environment is. And then it channels down to, you know, inappropriate, inadequate, poor decision making on procurement aspects, design aspects, construction aspects. So it is our responsibilities as, uh, as, as engineers and um, um, as uh, leaders to, to change this approach to develop um, 
methodologies that can quantify the ground uncertainty. So let me simplify the problem a little bit. Um, the current state of practice talks about, you know, there will be transition between, or there is a transition expected between geologic units uh, from station A to station B in tunnel reach Y. Uh, this is a very typical statement from a geotechnical baseline report or geotechnical interpretative report in whatever part of the world you are. Um, and it is shown as a single boundary. This has obviously led to a relatively higher number of tunnel failures, disputes, claims, litigations, just the examples that we saw on the previous slides. Now, instead of this very qualitative statement, what if we get a statement which says transitions between the two geologic units are expected to occur between station A and B with a probability of X percent? The median location of occurrence of the transition is somewhere uh, within the tunnel reach Y. And then an additional statement saying that the tunnel envelope is composed of C percent of a particular ge a geologic unit. So what have we done over here? What are what am what is what, what am I suggesting over here is we develop a quantitative measure of where the transition is going to occur. How early it is going to occur, to what extent, what is the proportion of a particular geologic unit, soil unit, rock unit, what is the occurrence probability? Because we understand numbers um, as, as human beings, we understand what is the magnitude and some sort of probability will be acceptable to a contractor, um, say 40% or a contractor believes anything below 40% is just useless for me. So. There is some sort of a quantitative measure of where that soil transition is going to occur. And, and this is what this presentation is all about. Um, moving away from a qualitative uh, assessment to a quantitative assessment. Again, if you are looking at the two options um, as an engineer, I find uh, the option to the right as the one that helps improve ground awareness. So let us dive into how we can improve ground awareness. Let us first talk about what is the current setup. So we are looking at a 2D soil profile from a geotechnical baseline report for a tunnel project in Seattle. The different colors obviously indicate different soil types over here, and you can see a gray band, uh, uh, gray band along the profile. That's the tunnel alignment. So in this case, no uncertainty is considered into the ground conditions. Um, and uh, these profiles are intended to advise the tunnel designers and contractors of what the anticipated ground conditions are. Um, and then contractor can choose their construction means and methods uh, um, and, their, and you know what the potential risks are on the project so they can adapt to appropriate risk mitigation measures. Um, and more importantly, uh, they are, these profiles are used to demarcate the risk allocation between the tunnel project owner and the contractor. Uh, and if it comes down to uh, differing site condition claims or financial litigations, uh, these are the only profiles that are referred to. But what is the issue over here is that we have no consideration of spatial variability, uh, no consideration of uncertainty. Um, there is because of the natural depositional processes, there is an obvious uh, spatial variability aspect in ground conditions. And as I said, um, very critical part of the document uh, because these are used for uh, risk allocation and resolving differing site condition claims and litigations. So in as an example, to give you a magnitude, again, we should come down to numbers and understand how important this is. In 2014, uh, the design build team for the Alaska Way Viaduct Tunnel submitted a differing site condition claim to the owner worth $20 million, and that was just after 10% of the drive. So you can completely understand what is the magnitude if uh, of 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 this occurring or or uh, differing site conditions occurring. If you're working on probably 
a 20 mile tunnel project uh, as it was being done in uh, uh, in, in Mumbai uh, for Mumbai Metro Line 3. So if you're in as congested and complex urban environment and uh, we do not need to go down the route of uh, having different site condition claims uh, or uh, not characterizing what the uncertainty and variability is. So what do we need for this? We need to quantify uh, what is the geotechnical spatial variability, and that can exist at different scales. Uh, we are looking at geological. Uh, we are looking at a geological scale over here. Um, uh, we can also between this, we can also look at city-wide scale, regional scale, um, and then we come to a specific geotechnical scale. You know, we have all looked at this uh, 2D profiles, trying to have a bearing capacity assessment. Uh, there's a much smaller scale when it goes to specimen level, uh, but uh, we'll pretty much uh, live in the zone of geotechnical scale for for uh, the rest of the uh, presentation. So we want to quantify spatial variability uh, and um, uncertainty. It pretty much it reflects uh, your decision to address that variability in 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 uh, geotechnical parameters. Uh, it's <clears throat> it's a, it's a it's a it's a very important aspect of the ground that needs to be quantified. Um, why? Uh, because less than one percent of the ground is investigated when it comes to tunnel projects. Um, you compare the volume of ground that's taken out during investigations to the volume of tunnel that is being excavated. Uh, that investigation, those investigations are insufficient. Obviously, um, I. Always, as a geotech engineer, uh, want more boreholes, but there needs to be a smarter way to drill your boreholes. Uh, they need to be located, understanding where your high uncertainty is, where your high spatial variability is, and that is where these two aspects uh, they come into picture. Um, of course, we are always dealing with spatial uncertainty. So, as designers, as engineers, our responsibility is to either design and build incorporating high uncertainty or develop methodologies that can quantify uncertainty, improve ground awareness, and then with appropriate uh, methods or appropriate uh, techniques, you can draw down the level of uncertainty. So I think site investigation is a great example for this. Uh, you need to drill, as in the case of the project from Singapore, they drilled another 25 boreholes just stacking them one next to another. But but if they would have like quantified uncertainty and improved their own ground awareness, uh, they would have drilled at the line, right locations and brought down the level of uncertainty. So this should be uh, this should be the objective uh, of 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 engineers working on complex tunnel projects. So this is where I come in and talk about um, the uh, 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 soil transition aspect. Um, we have been talking about uncertainty, but how is that quantified in this 2D profiles that I showed earlier? Uh, again, the GPR profile from tunnel project in Seattle. Generally, these profiles are laid out, laid out along the ring or along the station, um, and on the y-axis we have the elevation. So the black lines that you see, those are the stick logs, those are the boring logs. Uh, the colors are defined based on those boring logs. Uh, but there are these question marks uh, between every soil transition, especially uh, those are very critical in the tunnel zone. So there's a transition occurring from blue to green material in the top figure, and we do not know uh, where the transition is going to be. So there is only a qualitative measure in, and we are looking at a 2D profile along the tunnel center line. But what about the tunnel face, which is going to be into the page? And why is it into the YZ plane? Something looking like what is shown over here in figure C. There is no quantification of that in the current practice. Um, uh, and obviously has a huge impact on TBM operation and performance. So for either for face support pressure analysis or for ground deformation analysis, 
Um, the current practice just involves taking the ground conditions along the tunnel center line without taking into consideration the variability um, in the transfers or into the page uh, over here. Um, and that is an issue uh, because uh, boreholes are generally drilled at an offset along the tunnel alignment. You don't drill exactly at the top of the tunnel alignment. So in that case, um, that variability uh, because of the borehole offset needs to be quantified. And that is one of the important aspects I'm going to talk about is modeling um, your ground conditions in three dimensions versus just two dimensions as to what uh, is uh, done in current practice. So we'll be discussing a geostatistical modeling based approach to quantify the stratigraphic transition uncertainty. Uh, and I, 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 I name it a stratigraphic transition because we are transitioning between two units. Uh, and then we'll use or we'll see uh, how actual TBM data shows where the transitions really occurred. That's uh, that's the validation aspect of it. And we'll also see how an artificially intelligent ground model predicted soil transitions and compare those results. So the problem statement is pretty clear. Uh, when you're going from one soil to another, there's going to be a transition or there's going to be a change of uh, change in the depth of the layer. And that can happen uh, anywhere, and we need to quantify that. And what tools I'm using to quantify this? Um, Geostatistics um, is uh, my choice because it allows for uh, probabilistic interpretation of ground conditions, uh, helps quantify uncertainty. Um, successful, it has been successfully applied in geoscience problems. Uh, for natural resource evaluation, environmental remediation, and other earth science issues. Um, multiple realizations of ground conditions are considered uh, generated, and uh, that is how we sort of understand where the transition between the two units is going to be. So in this case, if we are tunneling from right to left, we will anticipate we are completely in clay. But in reality, um, there could be a possibility uh, that the sand layer is extending much below um, and hitting the top of the uh, hitting the top of the TBM. In that case, the phase pressure difference is, is could create certain issues. So when it comes to geostatistics, we are looking at modeling ground conditions, and there are a number of ways ground conditions can be modeled. One of the methods is transition probabilities. Um, and I'll explain this uh, in, a, in a bit, but just giving you a brief of, we start with the available geotechnical site investigation data, and we utilize all that geotechnical site investigation data to quantify um, the parameters that are required for geostatistical modeling. So we are not bringing anything from outside, just purely your geotech data set segregated into soil types. Um, so in this case, uh, this is an example where there were three soil types and um, it just signifies what is the probability of transition from one soil type to another um, as you go farther away uh, with distance. And on the y-axis, you see the probabilities. So as an example, if you are standing in space, and you are standing in space at a sam at a location where there is a clay sample. How far, uh, how far will you see another clay sample? So, probability of encountering a clay sample at that particular distance, which is zero, is obviously one because you're standing at a clay sample. But this probability decreases and sort of remains constant at 80% uh, for any farther distance. Similarly, um, if you are standing at a clay sample, then what is the probability of encountering sand uh, as you look at different directions in space? And in this case, it, it comes down to about 60%. Obviously, it starts with zero and it starts growing. So that is your transition probability of encountering one material uh, given that you are in a specific material. That's one way. Uh, the other ways are obviously the variograms. Uh, the variograms quantify the dissimilarity. So a good example of variogram or understanding variograms in spatial variability is uh, 
um, looking at uh, Airbnbs or uh, are you going for house hunting? In that case, if you're looking at a specific location, uh, the nearby properties have almost the similar price, you know, ballpark, same value. Um, but as you go farther away, uh, the price starts to change and there is no correlation between what was uh, observed in uh, at the first place. So in that case, uh, those uh, kind of um, structures, the radiogram structures help us understand what is the spatial correlation model, uh, how are uh, samples correlated. So in this case, um, obviously, um, we are using uh, um, um, the geotech investigation data that we have from the project side. Now, how do we model this rock type and ground types? Um, so we have borehole data. Uh, uh, this is just a sketchy example. Um, uh, different colors indicate uh, different uh, soil types. Um, once we have the geotech investigation data, all of that is put into a 3D simulation grid. And this is where I come in and talk about why do you need to have a three-dimensional ground model uh, because of all the uncertainties in the transverse direction that need to be quantified. For any tunnel project alignment, um, the approach is to understand what is the variability of uh, the ground at each uh, regional scale location of the tunnel project. And this is important because as you can see, I have divided the tunnel alignment into three different polygons. And uh, the reason I've done that is to understand what type, what is the proportion of a specific soil type as uh, as we progress through the tunnel alignment. Obviously, you can see a difference in the yellow, a difference in the blue, um, and there might all and there is an obvious difference in the green. Uh, the green doesn't exist towards the north over here, but does exist towards uh, the uh, bottom end of the tunnel alignment. So it's important to quantify uh, what is the vertical variability of uh, the soil types and uh, how uh, how those vertical proportions stack up when it comes to the whole complete alignment. Um, quantifying variograms, one of the important aspects of geostatistical modeling. Um, and then something sort of as a lithotype rule that understands and uh, what units are connected with what, what other units. Um, so for example, in this case, the yellow is not connected with green at all. Uh, and this is just straight coming from the borehole data. So the proportion curves, the variograms, and the connectivity or the spatial connectivity between the soil types helps us understand um, the parameters that are going to go into developing multiple realizations of ground conditions. So all these parameters are utilized to develop or generate multiple possibilities of ground conditions. Um, and at this point, uh, it requires a bit of uh, knowledge on um, um, what is the depth, what is the dip of the formation a particular formation, how we have to go back to desktop geologic studies and understand what type of um, layering do we have. And so all that, all those aspects are incorporated into, into the modeling uh, uh, within these two to three uh, stages of modeling. Once those multiple realizations are generated, uh, there is, uh, we can reutilize all of that to find what is the most probable or most likely ground condition. And that sort of helps you develop a 3D, um, single 3D profile of what the ground conditions are. So one of the advantages or the biggest advantages in this case, the realizations or the ground conditions are constrained to the geological data. Uh, we are utilizing the actual borehole data. We are utilizing what is the trend or pattern or variability or proportion differences of each soil type. And we're also utilizing and constraining it to which soil units need to be in contact with which other soil units. And then obviously the important aspect of radiograms, uh, because if the spatial correlation structure is satisfied, um, then there are a number of ways we can say that this actually represents um, what are the most anticipated ground conditions? 
Uh, obviously, uh, they have been successfully applied in other other engineering fields, and it's it's time we adapted to tunneling. So, uh, going to a specific example of a tunnel project, we start with the methodology over here. Uh, we have the geotech site investigation data from the project. Uh, more number of boreholes were used over here, but I'm just showing uh, the boreholes that were uh, uh, within uh, the first 1200 rings because the, most of the transitions occurred within the first 1200 rings. Based on the methodology that I showed earlier, uh, multiple realizations of the ground conditions are generated. And as you can see, uh, once I will have a most probable model, I'll have something uh, one of one transition between the orange and the blue over here and another transition over here. So that is what the focus of this presentation is on how to quantify those transitions. Once these individual realizations are generated, uh, we can quantify what is the proportion of each soil type at every ring. So uh, once uh, we have the proportion of soil types, we can apply probabilistic tools such as cumulative distribution functions or uh, confidence intervals uh, to quantify what is the occurrence probability of different soil at different locations. And then uh, this uh, helps us understand what is the quantitative assessment of the soil transition location uncertainty. So important aspect, you start with the boreholes, develop or generate multiple realization of ground conditions, uh, in this way, you're also quantifying the uncertainty, and then you're just utilizing all that information to develop uh, and quantify uh, to develop a quantitative assessment of uh, the tr soil transitions. So, in this case, uh, we're looking at a specific tunnel project. We have four soil types, uh, but those have been combined into uh, two soil types. We're looking at cohesive soils and cohesionless soils. So, blue. Anything blue that's cohesive, anything orange that's cohesionless. Um, so I started with the initial site investigation data, generated about 500 equally possible ground conditions for this project, and also generated a most likely ground profile. So we can see this is one of the transitions that's expected. This is another transition that's expected. And where do these transitions occur uh, within the tunnel alignment? A good question that comes up is why did I generate 500? How many number of realizations do I need to generate when I am working with a site investigation data from tunnel project? So in this case, you need to generate as many realizations uh, um, until your model is confident of simulating what it is simulating. So when uncertainty is quantified from um, a set of realizations, the difference in the uncertainty or the difference in or the median of the difference in the uncertainty between subsequent sets of realizations should be um, less than 1%. Uh, and in this case, as I said, I generated 500 or more realizations, but at about 460 geostatistical realizations, I observed that uh, the median of the difference in uncertainty between the subsequent sets uh, remains less than 1%. Uh, the meaning of this is your model is simulating the same soil type at the same location in space 99% of the times, and that sort of makes the model a little more confident or absolutely confident in what it is doing. Over here, when the uncertainty is high, the model has just simulated a soil type, but it is not 100% sure if that is the soil type or not. So there's a confidence that you gain uh, by the repeatability of the model in simulating a soil type. And, and that is why the number of realizations in geostatistical modeling are important. Once we have those individual realizations, uh, soil proportions within the tunnel envelope are, are, um, are quantified. So we are looking at 460 geostatistical realizations of a tunnel uh, of, of the site investigation data that we started with. And we are looking at a colored map of uh, what is the proportion of cohesive soil within the tunnel envelope and what is the proportion of cohesionless soil within tunnel envelope. Um, so in this case, the colored map indicates that there is <clears throat> a 
so so the extreme red color bands indicate that there is a 95% confidence that the that is the proportion of soil type so for example at ring 100 there's a 95% confidence that the proportion of soil type uh, cohesive with internal envelope is between 0 0.8 and 1 so we understand by this that we are predominantly in cohesive soils uh, at the start of the project at the start when we're tunneling from left to right now as we progress this proportion starts to dip um, and we have we have understood that we are encountering a uh, different material, the cohesion less material. That's why you see this increasing. And we are into cohesion less zone over here, and then we are back to cohesive zone. Uh, the proportion of soil types helps us understand where the transitions could occur. Um, so for example, in this case, um, wherever, I say wherever the confidence interval band process 50%, that is where the probability of transition of uh, uh, the two materials is. So cohesion, uh, oh, sorry, the proportion of the soils helps us understand uh, what is the proportion, what is the percentage of material of a particular type that is going to be excavated. In addition, it helps us quantify um, based on confidence intervals, how confident are you about uh, the proportion of the soil type within the tunnel envelope? So wider the band, uh, the higher is your uncertainty in that case. Um, so as an example over here, the band is pretty narrow, the band is pretty narrow, uh, but in the zone of transition, uh, the band is pretty wide. That means there is a high uncertainty in what is occurring within the tunnel envelope. So all those individual realizations are utilized to what I was talking about, a probabilistic tool as empirical cumulative distribution function curves. So for as we progress through the ring, what is the probability of occurrence of a particular soil type in proportions greater than 10%, 30%, 50%, 70%? 70%. So imagine we are going from cohesive soil to cohesionless soil. And um, we are looking at this 95% line. So at about ring 225, there is a 95% chance that 10% or more of the soil in your tunnel envelope is cohesionless soil. Now that grows to 30% pretty quickly. That grows to 50% almost immediately. And then eventually it grows to 70% by the time you reach ring 375. So we can see as the curves over here are pretty close, this indicates that the soil transition from cohesive to cohesionless is almost immediate. It's not gradual, it's almost sudden. Now, if you're going from cohesionless to cohesive and we're looking at 95% line, um, these points where the dotted lines um, intersect 95% line indicate that there is a 95% probability that the proportion of cohesive soil within your tunnel envelope is greater than 10%. So by the time you have reached after ring 450, there is a 10% or more cohesive, cohesive soil within your tunnel envelope. And as you can see, uh, that grows to 30% after about almost uh, 100 rings or 75 rings grows to 50% almost immediately, and then gradually grows to 70% uh, or more. So this indicates that this transition we are looking at, the soil transition to where tunnel goes from cohesionless to cohesive, is more of a gradual uh, transition rather than a sudden transition as what is observed over here. And obviously, as, as we're talking about cumulative distribution function, the, the growth of of uh, the curve, any curve, indicates uh, that there is a higher probability or higher number of occurrences of a particular event occurring at a particular ring. So uh, as a good example, uh, if you're looking at the blue curve over here, um, you can see uh, the step function just growing gradually and then just shooting up. So there is a high probability or higher number of occurrences that show um, that uh, the transition uh, of 
uh, the proportion of cohesive soil greater than 50% is, is, is pretty much between these uh, ring locations. So that's one of the insights into transitions in the longitudinal direction. And now when we accumulate all that information together and put it on the most probable geological profile. So we have the colored soil types, we have the groundwater conditions, uh, the black lines indicate the tunnel alignment, and the dotted black line indicates uh, the um, um, deterministic interpretation of where the transition is from the GBR. So as we start tunneling from left to right, we hit uh, at about ring 250 or 247 for that matter, where it says that there is a 5% probability that your proportion of cohesionless soil is greater than 50%. And that grows to a 95% probability that the proportion of cohes cohesionless soil is greater than 50% at about ring 275. So what is our uncertainty in this case? Uncertainty I'm quantifying as 90% confidence interval. So a difference between the two, point, uh, two percentiles. Uh, uh, that comes out to about 28 rings. So as I said, the first transition was going to be immediate, and that is why we have a relatively less uncertainty over there. Um, but look at the second transition. Um, you're going to start encountering greater than 50% of cohesive soil with 5% probability at about ring 420, and then it grows to 550. So there is about a 130 ring uncertainty on... Uh, or a 90% confidence interval on where the transition is going to occur. Similarly, we can apply this to vertical direction or in the transverse plane, uh, where we are quantifying what is the probability of mixed phase condition uh, versus elevation. So we have the TBM crown, TBM spring line, and the TBM invert over here. Um, the purple zone shows uh, the um, look, the, the region between the crown and the spring line, and the yellow zone shows the region between the spring line and the invert. So in this case, the difference in the probabilities is, 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 uh, is, is quantified as what is the probability of transition occurring between a particular zone of TBM. Um, so we're looking at TBM scale now, and we're looking in the transverse direction. Um, and these are just two examples of how um, uh, probability of mixed phase conditions were quantified for two different ring locations. So uh, quantifying that, uh, we have uh, a distribution of where that transition is going to occur. What is the probability of it occurring? So as you can see, as you progress through the alignment um, transition, if at all it is expected, it could occur up in the between the tunnel crown and the tunnel spring line. And then uh, as you progress through the alignment, it just shows you what is the probability of the transition occurring at the spatial location. And where does it occur? It gives us a median elevation of where the transition is going to occur along with confidence intervals. So a median elevation, uh, when we say, if we are excavating the first 300 rings, um, there is a pretty high probability that this transition is going to occur at about a median elevation of two. Um, after I cross ring 200, that probability drops to much low. That is why we have a higher uncertainty band in the background, uh, but a median elevation could be just below or at the spring line. So this is more of a quantified assessment of where the transition is going to occur. Um, but how much, how, how correct are these? Uh, you know, uh, we have just utilized site investigation data. We have just created a geostatistical model, ran some probabilistic tools, and quantified uncertainty. But how correct or how accurate are these? So I used uh, Bajayan's model to validate uh, where the uh, to validate where the transitions actually occur using the TBM data. Um, so in this case, I've examined what is the maximum dissipation of chamber pressure uh, at the tunnel spring line. Um, Bajayan says that when there is a uh, 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 sand or when EPBMs are excavated in sand, there is a higher dissipation of pore pressure during standstill. Uh, and standstill can be during rim building or maintenance or weekend or anything. Uh, but we are looking at the rate of dissipation of chamber pressure uh, within the TBM data. 
So as an example over here, as the, as the TBM progressed with excavation, uh, we see this was the chamber pressure. The blue highlighted is the standstill of the machine. Uh, and we can see the rate of dissipation of chamber pressure. Um, these rings were drilled, uh, were excavated in cohesive soils, and that is why we see uh, a pretty flat dissipation of chamber pressure um, compared to what we'll see in sands. So this is sort of a good example of, uh, of uh, what we are looking at. We're looking at time on the x-axis, pre chamber pressure on the y-axis, and then we're quantifying what is the dissipation or rate of dissipation of chamber pressure. Again, in sands, you would see smaller uh, bands of standstill, but higher pressure drops. So, rate of chamber rate of uh, the dissipation of chamber pressure is quite is quite significant when it comes to uh, sands at the tunnel phase. So, wherever the rate of dissipation is higher, um, we can understand that there is sand present or cohesionless soil present in higher proportions at the tunnel phase. And this is utilized to validate, validate the geostatistical results. So we have the GPR of our ranges for permeability of cohesionless soils, and we have GPR ranges for permeability of clay soils uh, from, uh, um, from the project documents. Um, and uh, this rate of, for a ring excavated in cohesionless soil, I uh, plotted the dissipation of pressure with time, and um, since it's an exponential uh, fit, I've quantified or back calculated what the probability is, uh, and it sort of falls into the zone of uh, the GBR ranges specified um, uh, in the documents, or the ranges of permeability specified in the GBR documents. So as you can see, um, for this particular um, example, this ring was excavated in cohesionless soil and that permeability calculation or back calculation just confirms that. Similarly, uh, the ring was excavated in cohesive soil and a back calculation of the permeability just confirms that. So this is helping us understand what we anticipated from geostatistical model. Is it correct or not? And it's always good to have validation. So I have a profile of the rate of chamber pressure versus the ring numbers. And pink lines or the magenta lines are the ones which were indicated as the location of transition by the GBR. Um, the red lines are the location of transition as indicated by, um, uh, by the geostatistical model. Uh, and I'm considering location of transition where 95% probability that more than 50% of uh, soil is a is is the soil of transition so in this case as you can see the rate of chamber pressure drop is pretty low uh, indicating that we are still in place um, and then the rate just starts to increase indicating that we have entered a different material cohesionless material over here for the bottom plot we are excavating in cohesionless soils uh, the gbr states you will see a transition at ring 520, but that doesn't really happen for next 30 rings. Um, and then eventually the rate of chamber pressure dissipation is much lower, indicating that we are in cohesive soils um, um, where more than 50% of the face is in cohesive soils. So this is sort of a good validation um, to understand where we have used the actual TBM data, because TBM is the only thing that can help us understand the ground, and that has helped. Um, can information entropy not provide insights on transitions? Uh, it uh, typically cannot because you see there is a transition over here, but um, a high information, there is no high information entropy uh, encountered. So um, simplistic tools such as just quantifying the uncertainty of the ground uh, is not going to help you understand transition. There needs to be more of a quantified assessment um, of, uh, the, of, of, of the transitions. Quickly jumping into the AI model, I see I have another um, 10 minutes and I'll come wrap this up in the next five minutes. Uh, but um, this AI model was developed uh, at the Colorado School of Mines um, by Mike Mooney and Hong Ji Yu. Um, and it takes into consideration uh, the both the ground condition and the human operation. Um, and um, um, 
TBM data is utilized um, for, uh, and the TBM data and the ground data are utilized to model the as encountered uh, ground condition model. Uh, I won't get into the details, but what sort of uh, TBM parameters are utilized? Uh, it involves thrust force, advanced rate, cutter head rotation torque, um, cutter head rotation speed, uh, screw conveyor torque and speed, chamber pressure, um, excavated soil mass, the vertical gradient of the chamber pressure, uh, and all of that is utilized and labeled with the soil types as encountered from the actual boreholes. And this model was developed with um, um, and, and was also um, evaluated for its accuracy versus the encountered bore or versus the soil types encountered in the boreholes. Um, pretty decent on uh, the accuracy and precision aspect, um, but there was an, it, there was a point where the soil types with higher proportion were easier to identify than the soil types with relatively lower proportion. So the as encountered TBM model was used to paint a picture of what could be the ex what could be the encountered ground conditions using this AI model. Um, so as you can see, the top is actually the whole GBR profile. Uh, the center plot is just the soil profile within the tunnel envelope from the GBR, and the bottom is the soil profile from uh, within the tunnel envelope using the AI model. And you can see there is um, good similarity or the AI model has really captured what the encountered soil type is. So my first validation was using the actual TBM data from a project site. My second validation is using this as encountered ground condition model to understand where the transitions uh, from geostatistical modeling occur. So in this case, I used a different project uh, again, I identify locations of two transitions between cohesive and cohesionless, and um, I have this soil proportion. Um, I have this proportion of soil types with respect to rings uh, on the top, and the validation comes into the picture into the PDFs over here or the probability distribution function. So uh, the green just the green curve just shows what are the possible locations of transition. Um, all the possible locations of transition. Uh, and the red line is the transition location from uh, the AI model. So uh, in this case, uh, as you can see, uh, the AI, the transitions from the AI model are, uh, or the transitions in the geostatistical model are validated uh, with the locations of transitions because it falls within the distribution and within one standard deviation of the distribution. So first validation was obviously using the actual machine data. Then second validation was using another model that was capable of capturing the as encountered material. And um, this was just a brief overview of you know how 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 the how the how the geostatistical models can be validated. Um, big picture if there's one thing that you can take away from this presentation uh, it should be that there needs to be uh, an assessment of uh, uncertainty there needs to be a quantification of uncertainty there needs to be a con communication of uncertainty in a way where the owner the contractor or stakeholders understand um, effectively what that means and uh, that can help uh, them have uh, active risk management and decision making on tunnel projects, which are very key uh, because we start at bit project procurement and we channel down to construction. Uh, things change and we need to quantify uh, what what the ground entails for us. And thank you for your patience uh, listening to me. Um, obviously, it's going to take take much longer than than you actually thought. So. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much, Richard. Splendid. Sure. Okay. Should I stop sharing?
Sure. Yeah, am I? Um, yeah, I have it. So thanks, thanks for that and for the brilliant, brilliant presentation. Really, uh, very interesting. Um, to the audience. On the chat, you can type in your questions and uh, we'll try to uh, respond to as much as we can in this limited time. So, first one from Anand, how and why a sinkhole forms? So, a sinkhole uh, is formed when... Um, so, what is a sinkhole? Sinkhole is a subsidence of the ground. And a subsidence of the ground means when you were excavating a tunnel below, you were not able to support the ground um, um, due to uh, due to excavation. So in that case, the machine was not able to provide enough face support and was not able to stabilize as it was excavating. And that sort of leads to uh, a formation of a sinkhole where, where the ground just collapses uh, because it has a space to go to. Thank you. There's a second one from Colin Warren. TBM and tunneling methodology surely has to be able to deal with all the variable ground conditions likely to be encountered along the road. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, that's the whole idea that um, uh, that 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 needs to be included into the current assessment or the current setup. Uh, which it is not, unfortunately, but there is increasing awareness and uh, it will be included into most of the cutting edge projects very soon. And uh, there's an interesting comment there from Chris Presley as well. Um, and then which Chris Presley question, you showed you have validated your models but I would like to know if any client owners had actually used your models in the GPRs as it saved them money. Yes, it has. Uh, we, as a research group at Colorado School of Mines, did this for a tunnel project in Washington, D.C. Um, called the Northeast Boundary Tunnel Project. Um, uh, we were involved in developing a 3D characterization of the ground conditions uh, to evaluate where, uh, what is the rate of uh, cutter tool wear that they are going to experience on the project and at what locations they should have interventions. So we were doing a real time monitoring and real time assessment of what is the rate of cutter tool wear and whether the contractor should stop for an intervention or not. Um, we were, and there were critical infrastructure, like there was an Amtrak rail yard, there was an existing metro line, or, or I mean, uh, uh, over the surface metro line passing. So, and uh, critical utilities as well. So, we uh, utilized these geostatistical assessments of ground conditions and geotech parameters like soil abrasivity that control cutter toolway. And we realized that, and we convinced the contractor uh, that you really need not have an intervention. Now, contractor convinced the client in this case that we really need not have an intervention uh, because this is what we are observing. The TBM cutter tools are fine and they can still excavate for another stretch, which was the end of stretch for them. So we saved an intervention in a complex urban environment, and I guess that's hundred thousands of dollars, I believe. Nice. Thank you. And uh, last couple of questions. One, Ian Kavanagh. Uh, what programs were used for the generation and viewing of the models, and would you recommend that these be used in future research? Um, so currently, some of this work is open source. I use um, I, I use codes written in R and um, some of my work that I've done in Python. 
Um, but there are programs out there uh, and I've used them. Uh, one is the ISATIS GeoVariances. Um, and then there are other open source tools as well for uh, geostatistical modeling, uh, like GEMPY. Um, but, but yeah, if you're looking for licensed products, I think I say this GeoVariances uh, does quite a bit of geostatistical modeling software, and we have used it in the past. It's pretty competent. Um, and yeah, I, I do believe they should be included for future research and for future work in the industry. And the last one from Maggie Lau. Uh, on your opinion uh, on machine learning, is good enough to predict the soil? I believe so. Yes. Um, obviously, there needs to be a care taken to you know um, any model is uh, when it when when we have the word model at the end of the definition or notation, uh, we should it should strike that it's garbage in and garbage out. And um, uh, we need to understand what parameters we are looking at. We need to understand the math behind the machine learning algorithm. And um, it is good enough to predict the soil. And you can also validate it with uh, uh, the actual uh, project data. Yeah. So thank you for the responses. And thanks uh, to the audience for the questions.